to start. I'm going to recap the main themes of chapters 15 through 18 that we are going to read from and analyze today. And then I will put the screen down once again and look with you at some passages. Keep in mind that usually my selections, my highlights from the textbook don't include a lot of the historical details and historical examples. This is not a course on Machiavelli per se, it's a course on Machiavellianism, so I will emphasize passages where you can see Machiavelli's philosophy. Then, of course, you can read everything else. You can use the notes to gather more information and support your understanding of those examples. But with the exception of a few famous examples, it's not there where you find the inspiring core of this book and this ideology. I posted lesson plans for the rest of the week. This week and the next we will not be watching any Machiavellian films or TV series because I want to complete my program. Therefore, this week we will talk about The Prince both today and possibly even on Friday. On Wednesday, I will be spending most of my time talking about the new Machiavelli and its author. Keep in mind that presentations will start next week and you can present or submit a video recording of your presentation up until May 13th, which is also the day of the final exam. In order to schedule your presentation on Zoom, if you prefer that option, you find inside the announcement a link to calendly.com slash Andrea Fede, where you can find all the available time slots, select one, and later on, if you want to change it, you just cancel and reschedule. I failed to mention that if anyone would, li would like to present in a more traditional fashion in front of the class, I can also accommodate that option throughout next week. So on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday of next week, if you let me know, I, I can make space, I can reserve 15 minutes for your presentation, okay? And if you present in front of the class, of course, uh, the expectation would be that you uh, bring some material to put on the screen. You can connect your uh, computer or you can bring it bring a, a flash drive with a selection of passages or talking points to support your presentation, right? Let me know if, if technical support is required, if some specific accommodations are necessary, and I'll help you set it up, okay? I also posted one uh, last reading at the end of this week which is about the new Machiavelli, okay? So, chapters 15 and the following, including 19, uh, today's program is to get to 18, but 19 as well falls under this set of ideas are essential to the understanding of the prince, but in many ways, we are equipped to understand those chapters and the concept. So what, the way I've organized them here is just a way that is functional to the structure of those chapters. But it's just a different way to present concepts that we have examined and discussed from different points of view throughout the semester, okay? Now this time though, there is a central notion that you find mentioned by Machiavelli passingly. That is to say, 
one of the difficulties in understanding the prints is making sure that you appreciate the relevance, the priority in terms of the intellectual hierarchy of some short references, passing references made by Machiavelli, which are in fact foundational to the whole system. But after all, The Prince was a short book by the standards of the period and not very structured by the standard of political treatises of the period. The target audience was other intellectuals, peers, intellectual peers of Machiavelli, that is to see, say, people with an agile mind who would be able to catch even minor references, minor in terms of the stylistic emphasis, the structural emphasis placed on them. One such central idea that you find here and in a series of passing references throughout the prints is that human nature is flawed. If human nature is flawed, every system of morality, whether it be social, political, religious, is not built on a strong foundation. And of course, Machiavelli predicates this on his lack of trust and lack of belief in the existence of a supernatural being who would be the guarantor of such a system of morality. From a pragmatic, realistic, historic point of view, Machiavelli observes that human nature is flawed, and therefore, morality cannot be the foundation of any social or political gain. It is, as a consequence, necessary, whenever you're presented with what I call a game, and in many ways, politics and international politics are seen from the point of view of game theory, and so the term becomes very appropriate. Whenever you find yourself in a specific context, which will have goals to be achieved, as well as skills to drive the deployment of strategies, and also a set of opponents, rivals, enemies, or simply people to be manipulated within that context, whenever you find yourself in a context, you extract from the context what the rules of the game should be. What are the boundaries in that particular context? Because morality, whatever system you look at, as I said, a philosophical system or a religious system, morality comes from with a universal set of rules. Whereas Machiavelli is saying, look at the context and see what are the actual boundaries there. Meaning, in any context, the boundaries will be set based on what is positive, what is negative for the outcome. What improves your chances of achieving the goal you set for yourself, the outcome you desire, or things that will negatively affect your chances of achieving that outcome. This is what counts. However, once you've established that human nature is flawed, and therefore you cannot expect other humans in any given context to play by the rules of morality, because even if they want to, their flawed human nature will make it so that they will not always play fair, not always play by the rules. Once you've established this, the next step is, is, uh, is, is, needs to be understood in order not to simplify what Machiavelli has in mind. Once you've established that premise, Morality is not going away. Morality is still there. Morality is still part of human nature and the human mindset. Can be aspirational, right? 
I would like to be moral. I would want the others to be moral. I strive for a moral behavior. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't, and others are like that. Well, you cannot completely discard morality. And of course, from one point of view, the existence of morality implies that moral judgments can be rendered on actions of leadership. And therefore, you can be labeled a cruel uh, dictator, a cruel leader, and what you do as a leader can be called cruelty, even though, as Machiavelli will establish in one of these chapters, we can define some force of cruelty, meaning anything that is deemed immoral, good, because they have a positive effect on the gain, they have a positive effect on the outcome, and in general, they might have a positive effect on the life of most people. Certainly the enemies will suffer more often than not, up to their elimination, off with their heads. And bad cruelty, which is something that is considered to be evil, immoral, dishonest, illegal, and at the same time it's bad because it does not have any positive effect on the outcome of the game. At the same time, you cannot completely discard moral judgments rendered on the basis of trust placed on the existence of morality, on this natural drive, because if you're considered to be cruel by too many people, that will affect your public image, your reputation, and hate, you'll be hated when in fact you want to be loved because you want your citizens to engage as much as possible in a cooperative, in a collaborative game with the government. That is to say, you don't want to spend too, much, too many efforts, too much energy in forcing people to be good and compliant with the policies of your government when you can spare those resources, you can save that energy and have people voluntarily comply with those rules, okay? So, morality is not the driving force of the game. Cannot be because human nature is flawed, but morality is there. And sometimes morality is built into the game, that is to say you have to manipulate your image, for example, in order to enhance your image, you need to play a game of appearances within a social or political context. You need to be believed to be good. You need the, most of the people to presuppose that you are an honest leader, that you support honest values, because this will generate influence and will save resources from having to deploy force at all times. So morality has some kind of secondary or tertiary role in one way or the other within most games, first of all. And keep in mind, as we've said many times, that the rules of the game apply to a context. However, that context is not inclusive of all of reality which means that within that particular place and time where a political game or a military game is played, you may achieve that outcome ignoring or violating morality, but life in general is more than politics in Machiavelli's game, in Machiavelli's view, is more than military crisis, so you will be judged, you cannot escape the judgment of posterity and even the judgment of your contemporaries. What are the consequences of the understanding of this basic premise that human nature is flawed? When it concerns the leader, the enemies of the leader, and the masses that are under the leader's control. Keep in mind that Machiavelli's idea is that there are very few people in any given time and place 
that can achieve the status of leader, okay? The idea is that you cannot just put your mind to it and become a leader. No, you have to be born with skills that are in demand within a particular context, and they're in demand because there is some kind of issue that your skills can provide a solution to. Besides that, besides being endowed with those skills by nature, with the right skills that are in demand, you need to develop. You need to potentiate those skills with proper uh, training, education, etc. The enemies that a leader can face are not very few. They are few, meaning there are very few individuals who are extraordinary enough to become leaders, but there are more enemies that he can face, many of whom will be inferior in terms of skill, but it doesn't mean that they cannot engage in a game trying to uh, uh, take power from the leader. The masses are the many. Most people belong to this group. Most people are gregarious in nature rather than being leader when it comes to society, right? When it comes to the social, the political context, or the context in which wars are played, it doesn't mean that people are gregarious when it comes to their own individual context, for example, when it comes to their business, right? So people can uh, um, exercise their leadership within their family, within their commercial company or enterprise, and still be gregarious in society when it comes to social and political games. So what are the consequences for these three groups? The fact that human nature is flawed applies to the leader as well, right? The leader being human, you can expect to find flaws in the leader as well, right? In, in many ways, even Cesare Borgia, the perfect example, was flawed and failed and caused his, was responsible for his failure, for example. But more in general, more specifically, in reference to these chapters 15 through 18, the idea of human flaws transforms into a discussion of the vices of the leader. That is to say, since human nature is flawed, even the leader is not perfect. And besides having some exceptional, extraordinary skills, the leader will have some vices, some shortcomings, some imperfections, which can be moral in nature. That is to say, some immoral uh, habits, so to speak, or, or some sins. Now, in reference to this, Machiavelli says, even if you're the leader, and therefore you're supposed to have as much power as possible, as much control, over the rules of the games as possible, you still have to exercise self-control over those vices that will have a negative impact on your image, on your appearances. Because otherwise, if your vices become public, then the people will not be supportive, the people will not be able to love you. And even though you cannot rely on their love, at any point in time their love can turn into hatred, you still need to play that game because at least part of the time people will just follow you. Okay? So keep this in mind that even the Machiavellian leader is not as it appears in some of the literature that exploits the name of Machiavelli, someone who cheats and does whatever he wants. Okay? No, there are some boundaries. There are some boundaries that are built into the context. In this case, vices can affect the appearances, can affect the public image, or at least some of them can affect uh, the public image of the leader. There, some self-control is required, with the understanding that even with some self-control, not all vices can be controlled, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, since human nature is flawed, when it comes to any competitive context, if the question is, 
Do I have to play fair? Of course not. Why not? Because since human nature is flawed, the others, my enemies, will not play fair. At least not predictably, right? I cannot count, I cannot rely on my enemies playing fair, and therefore I don't have to play fair. Sometimes, in fact, I have to do the opposite, whether I want it or not. So playing fair or not is not a result of my vices. It's not like, since I'm flawed, I can be immoral. No, I can or I have to be immoral if immorality, violating some of the basic rules of justice, diplomacy, etc., will give me, will ensure that I uh, achieve the outcome that I want to have for this particular context, okay? And then, regardless of the vices in general, even though human nature is flawed because morality is still there, this premise does not cancel morality entirely, just reduces its relevance, but it doesn't cancel it. Therefore, I still have to be, to play the part of the family man, for example. Family value leader is one of the most common games in modern democracies, right? Or I have to be believed uh, to be honest, uh, to be even religious, right? And therefore be seen at religious events, at religious ceremonies, uh, to be seen with uh, upstanding citizens, with members of the clergy, etc., etc. Because that is part of the game of influence. Whereas this category uh, more often applies to the deployment of various forms of force. Enemies too fall under this premise. So if human nature is flawed, enemies will have some vices that from the point of view of the leader are weaknesses that can be exploited to advance the game of the leader. As I said, this means that the enemies will not be fair in any predictable way, and therefore I don't have to be fair with them. As far as appearances, it's important for enemies to perceive that you're playing the game of appearances so well that you gain a lot of love, you gain a lot of support, that a lot of people are supportive of your policies, of your leadership in general, if this happens, if these two parts of the game are played correctly, then the enemies will be deterred. Enemies, internal and external, will not want to attack, try to take the power and control out of a leader who plays this game well, who's respected and loved, to a point where there are many people in society who will voluntarily uh, commit their time, energies uh, to complying with the government. As far as the masses, the populace is concerned, the fact that human nature is flawed as a consequence is, is that they will need to be, uh, uh, will need to have boundaries enforced. And the only way to make them less flawed and therefore more honest, as honest and moral as possible, is for the leader to use fear of punishment to create boundaries and make them moral. So you see that morality is reframed within this intellectual ideology, not eliminated, okay? It's not cheat and do what you want. That is not the essence of Machiavellianism at all. And in fact, it would be a very rudimentary, a very primitive, analysis of politics, society, life in general, if it were to be so. So fear will be deployed, will be used by the leader in order to enforce boundaries, which is essentially an enforcement of morality within society. But because men are not perfect, they need to have this fear of punishment in order to be honest. You cannot just tell them honesty is a good thing. Now, as far as playing fair based on uh, morality, when it comes to the relationship between the leader and the masses, there is one area where 
the prince has to play fair with his subjects, or almost so. So even though, again, the leader has almost uh, boundless power, uh, absolute power over the state and over the citizens in this system, there are still some boundaries that he has to respect. And as far as the populace is concerned and the interaction between the leader and the citizens, he has to play fair as much as possible when it comes to wealth, properties, and families. That is to say, he has to refrain from taking property from the citizens and offending their family, where offending is a technical term for Machiavelli, meaning use violence, exercise violence. It is not an absolute rule, because we don't have universal rules of morality, but as much as possible, based on personal shortcoming and the rules of the game, as much as possible, the leader should not touch the wealth, the properties, and the family of the citizens, because otherwise, fear will easily turn into hatred. And as I said before, the goal of the leader is to generate as much love as possible, which means that his influential over society and people will voluntarily comply with the practices of the government. And therefore, the prince cannot ignore morality at all, even just when it comes to appearances. Okay? Is that clear enough? Do you have? Any questions or any comments about this? Okay, now, because human nature is flawed, even love generated by influence, by having a good reputation, a good image, even love can turn into hatred. That is to say, in this system, fear is to be uh, emphasized over love because fear produces a more predictable compliance, a more predictable form of compliance than love. Because even without good reason, even while your image and reputation are not tarnished, people can turn away from you. Okay? And you can see that, for example, even in the game of influence played by celebrities. There may, might be a scandal, right, that uh, uh, creates a disconnect between the uh, the fan base and the celebrity because appearances are broken or even without that after a while influence can be lost right so human nature is flawed and therefore you cannot count on the permanence of love love can turn into hatred in many ways however even fear if it is used to often, too intensely, can generate hatred. And therefore, this is a correction to the previous statement, even though you can rely more predictably on fear, you cannot rely just on fear, because if you overdo it, then fear will turn into hatred which in other terms means if uh, citizens are forced to be honest and comply by the rules because otherwise they'll be jailed or they'd be killed but this is done excessively then you're not afraid any longer right the best example would be a, a Chinese city such as Shanghai, 20 million people being caged in their apartments, and of course the Chinese government can instill a powerful fear of punishment. And there are armed people in the streets, people can be taken away, but how much can you keep this situation without being hated by the citizens at a point where they're not afraid anymore? and they know that a revolution will cause casualties, but they're willing to face that risk rather than live in constant fear, right? That would be a perfect example where fear alone 
can give you a predictable result for a short period of time, right? For a week, for a few weeks. But can this situation go on for months? Can this situation be replicated in Beijing, where COVID cases now are rising, for example, without some consequences? Uh, you, you need to have some kind of collaborative behavior, uh, voluntary compliance from the citizens, not just fear. Okay, so keep that in mind when you read those passages. Now, I'll bring down the screen again and show you a selection of passages that illustrate the concepts that I just discussed. We just need to wait for the projector to warm up the system to activate. I hope you can read with the highlights. And these are the pages from the book. The Kindle version has the page, the same page numbers, the same formatting, etc. This is the end of chapter 15, which is one of the key passages that illustrate the concept of human nature being flawed. And if you read the third line from the top, that begins with, but, but since these qualities cannot be had, cannot all be had, meaning the good qualities, that the qualities that traditional philosophical or religious systems of morality labels as good, and since one cannot wholly observe them as human conditions do not allow it. Human conditions do not allow it is one of the ways Machiavelli expressed this idea that human nature is flawed. And then there are other passages that you find in here where he has the nastiest terms for other humans and their behavior. It is necessary for the prince to be prudent. And again, the necessity applies to both the deployment of immoral practices and strategies, but also, okay? Okay. But also to the conduct of the leader himself. Again, the leader is not free to do whatever he wants simply because Machiavelli has said that moral rules can be um, violated. Not at all. It is necessary for the prince to be prudent to the extent that he knows how to flee the infamy of those vices that might take the state away from him. And again, this is the understanding by Machiavelli that even the leader is not perfect. So as much as he can, he has to avoid um, vices that would uh, impact negatively on his image and reputation. And uh, he, uh, he develops this reasoning saying that some of those vices will not be controlled. Right. Chapter 16 is simply a chapter where Machiavelli explains that things that have a direct understanding or things that are defined in a direct way as positive or negative in a system of ethical values are not really positive or negative in the context of the game unless you consider the outcome. So liberality can be considered positive especially in the culture of the late Middle Ages, but it is not necessarily so when you look at a specific context and the outcome of the game, because liberality means that you would be wasting as a leader a lot of resources that are key in society. Your liberality may be based on heavy taxation, right? 
you are being liberal, generous as a leader with the money that you've taken from the citizens and therefore the end result of that waste of resources is negative for society in general because it affects the economy and the ability of the citizens to be productive. It also affects you because eventually you'll have fewer resources to deploy where it counts, for example, in the building and the equipment of a powerful army. Keep in mind what the culture of the aristocracy from the Middle Ages had been. Liberality, the generosity of the aristocratic leader was an essential element in the construction of the concept of what it means to be noble, what it means to be an aristocrat. It was especially a strong concept, a strong construct during the Middle Ages, but some of that system survived until the French Revolution. It's the idea that to be truly noble, to be a true aristocrat, means not to have any consideration for material things, such as money, property, resources in general. That is to say, you have, in order to be considered noble, you have to show that you give no consideration to material resources by offering lavish parties or by giving extravagant gifts randomly, occasionally, to the citizens. And this is testified also in the literature of the Middle Ages and of later time. You can think, for example, of the extravagant lifestyle of the European monarchs, particularly the French monarchs, up until the French Revolution. But the same thing is found in the chivalric tradition. The knight is a warrior that emphasizes the spiritual side of the fight, and this is than the tradition that is retrieved and reproposed through, for example, the Star Wars series of films. As a consequence, the, the knight has to be generous, has to live like a hermit, conduct a, a, an essential life where, again, he can be generous to the point where the generosity is damaging to himself as well. In the case of Florence in particular, and the literature that developed in Tuscany, there is a famous example of this in Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron. The Decameron is the collection where we uh, got the first novella, the novella of Ciappelletto, this most terrible man who renders a false confession to a holy priest and becomes a saint. In another novella that was very famous during that time, there is an aristocrat, who's also a knight, lives by the values of chivalry, who's in love with a woman, an aristocratic woman in Florence. And in order to court that woman in a chivalrous way, he spends a lot of time offering lavish parties hoping that she will show up, be impressed with his spiritual side as such a magnanimous, generous host and uh, engage in, in a romantic game that might lead them to have a relationship or even a marriage. The woman doesn't fall for it. The knight is impoverished by this uh, expensive lifestyle to the point where he has to abandon the city and uh, uh, therefore sell the palace he has in the city, re re retire to a country state where he only has one house and some land around it. And the only thing that still makes him worthy of the name of aristocrat and the label of knight is the ownership of a falcon and the activity of falcon hunting. Hunting was one of the uh, aristocratic pastimes and considered to be uh, a, a sport, um, even by a spiritual definition. 
Falcon hunting was the peak of that kind of activity. So in this country state, uh, the, this, this poor knight Federico conducts a, a frugal life, right? It doesn't have a lot to live on. And the only thing that makes him feel aristocratic, genteel, is to go out with the falcon. The woman becomes a widow, loses her husband, moves to the countryside herself with a young son from the marriage. The son, uh, uh, they live in a nearby estate. The son uh, watches the falcon fly in the skies above Federigo's estate. And to him, the falcon is the ultimate toy. He wants one, he wants that one. And since acute desire in the medical, biological beliefs of the Middle Ages can make you physically sick, this child becomes sick. And once the woman learns what is making her son sick, she has to show up to Federico's house. This is kind of embarrassing because she knows he was in love with her. And, and she doesn't want to go there and say, I'm here, take me, give me the falcon, right? She doesn't want to engage in this kind of transaction. She's herself an aristocratic woman. She's a pure woman by, by definition, by the uh, aristocratic value system. So she goes there and uh, she asks for, to visit. And of course, Federico says, yes, come and have lunch with me. And she wants to engage in this conversation, right? It's a difficult conversation. So at the end of the lunch, she says, I have a request. My son would like to have your falcon, right? And, and this is the only thing that can restore my son's health. However, it's too late because Federico, who's an honorable, chivalrous man, could not entertain an aristocratic woman, a gentle woman, with a simple peasant lunch, right? He cannot offer turnip and potatoes or a chicken. She's an aristocrat. So what's the only exotic things he could offer? He sacrificed, without saying anything, he sacrificed the falcon and served the falcon at the lunch because that was the only exotic food that would be the only way to honor the, the, the level uh, of, of, this, of this woman. So at the end of the lunch, he has to say, I'm sorry, but I had to cook the, lunch, the, the falcon and serve it to you because it was the only thing, the only horrible thing to, to do. So by the end of the novella, the poor kid will die, right? Desire goes unsatisfied, the kid dies. Good riddance. The two will get together because she'll be so impressed by the spiritual level of this man who sacrificed the only thing of value, the only thing that made his life worth living, that she appreciates the, 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 the qualities of this man. They marry, however, at the end of the story, they go back to Florence, but, and, and he goes back into being rich because this widow, the woman, is wealthy. And she has inherited everything, right? Uh, the, the kid has died. So uh, he, at the end of the story, has a different understanding of the value of frugality and parsimony versus liberality. He has understood that being overly liberal, meaning overly generous, can be damaging, especially in a mercantile society. So the novella is just an allegory of the end of a time and its culture, the end of the Middle Ages, with this idea of what nobility is about, being extravagantly uh, uh, generous to the point where you spoil yourself of everything you have, you ruin yourself, because this is what Federico did at the beginning by offering so many parties just to, not to have anything in exchange, but just to attract the attention of this woman that he made himself impoverished. Whereas, whereas in a mercantile economy such as that of Florence during the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, 
money cannot be wasted. You need money to invest. You need money to uh, support your manufacturing activities, your banking activities, etc., etc., your, your um, investments and your, your uh, various commercial uh, enterprises. Okay, so this chapter seems to be a bit different from the others, and one might ignore the relevance it had for the readers of Machiavelli and for Machiavelli himself, for whom this uh, debate was still present. There were still uh, memories of this debate that Florence and the community of Florence went through between about what it means to be noble. The traditional values of the aristocracy were predicated on disregarding the value of money and being generous to a fault to show that you were an aristocrat in spirit. The new value system of the merchants is predicated on being as thrifty and parsimonious as possible because money has to be applied to the capitalistic enterprises. This is really what the chapter is about. Then there is also the inclusion of a reference to war, whereby you can go to war, and this is also reflective of the practices of the time, with fewer resources, you can wage a military campaign without enough money to pay your soldiers through the end of the campaign because you gamble on the results of the campaign. If you're able to pay your mercenary soldiers at the beginning, if you have enough money to initiate this military campaign, then after the invasion, you can live off the land that you invaded. So you don't need to pay your soldiers as much as you did at the beginning of the campaign because you can just let them loot the enemy country and live off of that country, which is something we've seen through a long series of wars around the world, right? Where looting is part of the system. It's not a violation of morality. It's the way that uh, an enemy uh, army can support itself within enemy territory, okay? But again, being generous or being parsimonious, being thrifty, it's all seen within the rules of the game. How does it affect your appearances? You need some of that to build up your appearance, do it. But if you do it, by damaging, touching the properties and the wealth of your citizens, then there you will find some hard boundaries. If you engage in that kind of activity, then you'll suffer the consequences. The outcome of the game will be affected. Chapter 17 is about cruelty and about love and fear. And once again, Machiavelli says, it would be best to be compassionate and not cruel However, you, the leader must be alert not to use this compassion badly, which means it is not compassion if the outcome of the game is affected in a negative way and the consequences will be disastrous for the leader. Definitely, right? The leader might see the end of their leadership, but can also be disastrous for society because order is needed the observance of moral boundaries need to, be, uh, need to be enforced by the leader and therefore the whole of society might suffer from cruelty that is not used well. And the example that is given there is the example of my home, my own hometown of Pistoia, which was famous throughout the Middle Ages for being a town of feuds, of feuding parties and families. To the point where uh, there was also an alleged historical explanation of this. The area of Pistoia, the mountains over Pistoia, which is about 20 miles northeast of Florence, 
northwest of Florence, um, is the place where the famous Roman rebel Catilina and his supporters and his army were defeated and uh, destroyed. And order was restored in uh, the Roman Republic as a result, although temporarily, because Catilina is defeated only 20 years or so before Julius Caesar will cross the Rubicon and advance on Rome. But the idea is that where, those, where did those rebels end up? Some of them died, some of them were uh, taken prisoners and taken back to Rome, some of them stayed there. And their blood, their seeds made the Pistoians so rebellious. And such a feuding community emerged from that genetic pool that was tainted with the soldiers of Catilina, those who supported the idea of destroying Roman society, of creating chaos and anarchy, of destroying the good values of the Roman Republic. So throughout the Middle Ages, there were feuding families in Pistoia. They engaged the support of Florentine families and therefore this feuding extended to Florence. The uh, example was so scandalous and became so famous that even John Adams, the second president of the United States, in one of his writings, there are, if you go, you find them even in this library, the 19th century edition of the writings of John Adams, about 10 volumes, this big. There are 90 pages in one of, those, of John Adams' books about the city of Pistoia, which during the Middle Ages had the town itself at probably about 10, 15,000 people and had that many people up until the end of the 19th century. So very small place. And John Adams examines the whole of the history of the feuding in Pistoia because his idea is that this can be a real issue even in the colonies. The new, newly created United States might suffer from that because they themselves have a few wealthy families and these few wealthy and, and influential families might engage in the kind of feuding for control of the government that affected the history of Pistoia. So somehow John Adams got hold of a 17th century history of Pistoia and uh, he might have understood enough Italian as an educated man of that period who had studied Latin for sure to read, it, uh, read this text himself or he might have had someone translate or summarize this text for him. And these 90 pages are a paraphrasis of that history of Pistoia because he thought that people in the US needed to study this example to avoid the issues that might repropose themselves in there. I'll stop because it is time. As I said, I will continue not the next week, but this week on Friday with the analysis of the next chapters trying to get to the end of the Prince and chapter 26 by next week.